Well, thanks, Dave, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar for the Institute of Measurement and Control. Thanks very much for joining. Uh, my name is Will Cowdroy. I'm a principal consultant with ESC, Engineering Safety Consultants. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about functional safety assessments, FSAs, um, and providing some of my experiences from FSAs, some of my colleagues' experiences, um, and particularly focusing on learnings for the end user which is uh, I, I spend a lot of time working with um, oil and gas operators and, and chemical plant operators. So I thought I'd, I'd focus on the, the end users today. So a brief introduction to ESC. We're a global technical safety, functional safety management consultancy and safety systems design provider. Our primary function is supporting clients in technical safety aspects, of processes, systems and equipment deployed in oil and gas, petrochem, various industries. ESC provides services and solutions that enables operate, uh, owners, designers, operators in all of those industries listed there to plan and manage their assets and projects more safely and successfully. And ES, ESC, as Dave mentioned, is now part of the ERM group. It's an ERM group company. Uh, we've been part of ERM for about three months now. Um, ERM is a leading global provider of em environmental health, safety, risk, social consulting services and sustainability related services with over five and a half thousand employees uh, around the world. So um, we're really excited to be part of ERM and, and uh, see see what it brings moving forward. Quick slide on myself. So I'm, my background's in chemical engineering. Um, I'm a TV Rhineland functional safety engineer um, with almost 10 years experience now across oil and gas, chemicals, biocontainment. I've done some work in nuclear defense um, and energy sectors. Um, I used to work on a few different coal fired power stations and worked on a UK oil refinery. Um, I'm a safety and risk consultant, previously worked for DMVGL, now ESC, um, specialising in functional safety consultancy in accordance with um, IEC 61511 and 61508 primarily, um, with experience across the life cycle, the safety life cycle, which I'll, I'll talk about the life cycle during the presentation. Um, I've done functional safety assessments for a range of different clients and industries, including international oil and gas projects. Um, I've developed and audited functional safety management systems, delivered training, and I'd spend a lot of my time chairing various types of safety study, including HAZOPs and LOPAs and uh, failure modes and effects analysis. Today's webinar will be in three main parts. So I'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes just introducing the topic of functional safety for those that don't work in the sector or, or need a recap. Um, and I'll talk about functional safety management, which is where the FSA sits within the standards. Um, I'll talk in part two about the role that FSAs play in the life cycle and when we should do FSAs. Um, and then part three is, the, is the, the main part, which is talking about some key learnings for end users, um, focusing on, on experience that I've had and some of my colleagues have had, as I mentioned. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A session, so please do submit any questions in the chat and I'll try my best to answer them. Um, if not today, then um, following the webinar. So part one is a brief introduction to, to functional safety. So um, a couple of definitions. We all know what safety means, maybe not by this definition, but basically freedom from unacceptable risk. So hazards will always be present and we can't reduce the risk to zero it's impossible to do that so the aim from a technical safety point of view is to reduce the risk to an acceptable level and functional safety is part of that overall safety it's the part that's provided by the electrical electronic or programmable electronic um, safety systems um, the definition shown here is from 61508 it's quite wordy um, but I'll talk about some, of these, some of these terms in, on the next few slides um, but basically what it's saying is Wherever we have a reliance on um, EEPE safety systems as a risk reduction measure, we're then involved in functional safety and we need to be aware of the standards and their requirements. So some terminologies from IEC 61508, which is the, the gen general international standard for functional safety. Um, we've got equipment under control, EUC. This is your equipment, um, machinery or plant. Um, and then we typically have a control system which takes input signals from the process or from operators and generates output signals, which causes the equipment under control to operate as desired. And in addition to the normal control system, we then may have an independent safety system, an EEPE safety related system. Um, and this is defined as a safety system which implements safety functions to achieve or maintain a safe state for the equipment under control, um, which is the functionality of the system and also uh, achieves the necessary safety integrity. Um, and the safety related system may be made up of three main parts. So the sensing element, 
or sensor, um, a logic device, which could be a simple relay or a contactor, or could be a programmable logic controller like a PLC, um, and a final element, which could be an actuator closing a valve or a pump contactor or something like that. They're the three main parts of a, of a safety function. And you may have some in interfaces in between. And then there's the process sector's interpretation of 61508, which is IEC 61511. And in, in 61511, they refer to the process, which is the equivalent to the EUC. Um, the basic process control system is, the, is obviously the control system. And instead of talking about safety related systems, it talks about safety instrumented systems or SIS. Um, so apologies if I do interchange between the two in, in the presentation. So the safety related system or SIS is typically made up of a number of safety functions or SIFs in 61511. Um, and these are functions that are intended to achieve or maintain a safe state for a specific hazardous event. So yet as part of your safety system, you'll have various safety functions. And the safety function has two main parts. It has the functionality and the safety integrity. The functionality part is the what has to be done. So this is what has to be done so that the specified hazardous event doesn't take place or, or is mitigated. Um, and an example of the functionality in the process sector might be in order to prevent the rupture of pressure vessel X, valve Y should open in two seconds when the pressure in the vessel rises to a specific set point, 2.6 bar. Um, and we usually come up with that function in the early phases during that HAZOP study or during the laser protection analysis or when we um, provide the specification. The second part is the safety integrity or safety performance. Um, and this is how well um, does it need to perform, the likelihood that the safety function performs, uh, brings the system to a safe state. And an example of that would be SIL2. So we talk about safety integrity in terms of safety integrity levels. There's four levels. SIL1 is quite easy to achieve. SIL2 is more difficult to achieve. And SIL3 is very difficult to achieve. And we don't tend to see SIL4 in, in the process sector, at least. Um, so we, we combine these two main parts and we come up with something called the Safety Requirement Specification, or SRS. Um, and that's a key document through the life of the safety instrumented system. So I want to briefly talk about the functional safety standards. I mentioned IEC 61508 is the basic safety publication for EEPE safety related systems. In the UK, the regulator, the HSC, views 61508 as the general benchmark of good practice on how to specify, design, implement and maintain safety related systems. It sets out a life cycle approach um, and I've shown a simplified version of the life cycle there. So at the top, you've got the concept. You come up with a concept for your safety system. You then specify it in a lot of detail, exactly what it needs to do, how it needs to respond to different, um, so lots of utilities, what's the set point, what's the response time. We then design the system against that specification. We implement and engineer the system, install, commission, validate it against that specification. We then go through and operate and maintain the system, possibly for decades, um, so that it works when we need it to, when, when we have a demand on the system. And then if we make any modifications, we may then need to go back to an earlier phase, um, which makes it the life cycle. So if 61508 is, is like the mother standard for functional safety, which is used across industries, um, we have some uh, interpretations for different sectors. Um, I typically work, as I mentioned, with owners and operators of process plants um, in the oil and gas, chemical, biocontainment industries. Um, and they're required to follow IEC 61511 um, and possibly sometimes the machinery standard 62061. Um, however, they do need to follow aspects of 61508. And that's what this slide is, is, is telling us. So which standard do we need to follow? So in the process sector, the way it works is that IEC 61508 is used for manufacturers, for suppliers of devices. So if a, if a manufacturer is um, uh, developing a valve or a relay, um, that obviously may be used across different sectors. So they, they are IC 61508. IC 61511 is focused towards SIS designers, integrators and end users. Um, and as I mentioned, the webinar is focused um, towards end users and therefore I'll be talking about IC 61511 quite a bit. So the sector specific standards also follow a life cycle approach and this is the safety life cycle simplified from IC 61511. The life cycle sets out the activities involved in implementing a safety instrumented function starting with phase one, which is the hazard and risk assessment, uh, which is typically in the process sector, a HAZOP study, hazard and operability study. And this is where we identify hazardous events and assess the risk. Um, and we take the output of that HAZOP study 
and we use it as an input for phase two, which is allocation of safety functions to protection layers. And this is basically your, where you determine what the SIL target is going to be. Um, and we use methodologies such as LOPA, laser protection analysis or risk graph um, to determine the safety integrity based on the residual risk gap once we've taken into account all of our other protection layers. Uh, and these studies help us to uh, develop um, the SRS, which is phase three, so safety requirement specification, as I mentioned, a key document throughout the life of the safety system. Um, we then design and engineer the system, install, commission, validate it all against the SRS, um, and then we operate and maintain it. But regardless of where you um, are working within this life cycle, um, some people may only be responsible for, say, installing the system or designing the system. Um, regardless of where you start your project, you must have these dark blue boxes down the left and right hand side in place. The first ones are management of functional safety and functional safety assessments and auditing and safety lifecycle structure and planning. And these are really the backbone of the, the functional safety standards. They provide a structured approach um, and ensure that each life cycle phase is carried out effectively and by competent people against a clear plan. Um, verification is about ensuring that each phase, that's the one down the right hand side, it's ensuring that each phase is completed before moving to the next phase. And again, ensuring that traceability between the life cycle phases. Um, and ultimately, the, the purpose of these three dark blue boxes is to remove the opportunity for systematic errors as we as we move through the life cycle. And these systematic errors could be the root cause of, a, of, a, of the system not working properly years down the line. So they could be the root cause of, a, of an incident um, because these systems often pro uh, provide a last line of defense. Uh, so, for example, if we had an error during the initial hazard and risk assessment or during the specification of the safety system, um, this could be the reason that the system doesn't perform um, on one of the few occasions that it's actually needed. Um, so hopefully if we have adequate management of functional safety, if we carry out audits and we carry out FSAs and verification activities, the systematic errors should be prevented in the first place or identified and resolved as we move through the life cycle. So I want to talk about a bit about management of functional safety because this is where FSAs um, really fit into the life cycle. So any organisation that's responsible for any of the phases within the life cycle or any other, any functional safety related activities need to have a management system in place to, to, to demonstrate how they are complying with the standards and how they're achieving functional safety. Um, it's often called a functional safety management system. It sometimes is part of the general safety management system or process safety management system, um, but it's ultimately a collection of documents, policies, procedures, work instructions, templates, which describes how an organization manages different aspects related to functional safety, how they achieve the standards. So there's a very simple example there, breaking it down into policies. How do you manage competency and operations? The policies should, should tell you who's responsible for functional safety, how we're going to carry out functional safety assessments, how are we going to perform validation and verification activities, et cetera? Um, uh, next slide on that as well. So yeah, if, if we do implement and follow a robust functional safety management system, it allows the organization to demonstrate all of these things. It demonstrate that we're adequately managing competency for activities in the life cycle. So the right people are responsible for the right, for the right tasks um, and we're, we're managing that. Um, structured activities. Um, for each life cycle phase. Um, so it's again comes back to that traceability, making sure that we have that line of sight through the life cycle. Planning, verification and validation um, to ensure we've got a coherent and aligned outputs from each phase. And all of the above again um, works towards removing systematic errors um, which could remain in the system throughout its life. Um, and we need to make sure it's performing that necessary risk reduction that, we, that we've planned for it to, to perform. And by having all of that in place, and by having audits and carrying out your FSAs to interrogate performance, you can then uh, claim that you achieve functional safety. So hopefully that's a useful uh, introduction recap. Um, the next section is more about FSAs. So I just wanted to start by talking about the difference between uh, FSAs, functional safety assessments and functional safety audits, which are not FSAs, even though it would be the same acronym. Um, so these are definitions from IEC 61508. Um, an FSA is defined as an investigation based on evidence to judge the functional safety achieved by your safety related systems um, or the, and or other risk reduction measures. So it's a judgment as to whether the systems are achieving the SIL targets 
and the requirements of the, of the SRS and that they're complying with the standard. Um, it's a pass fail. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about FSAs obviously in the next few slides. The difference with an audit is a functional safety audit is like any any audit really. It's a check whether the company is following its own procedures and plans. Um, and the key note is there, and that's from the standard, a functional safety audit may be carried out as part of an FSA. Um, we also often see them, them carried out as part of verification activities, um, but that's the key difference. So a few snippets from the standards on what they say about FSAs. So. Um, it says that a procedure shall be defined um, in such a way that a judgment can be made. So we need to have a clear procedure and assessment criteria, um, often a checklist, um, so that this judgment can be made, this pass fail. We often think of it as, a, as an individual exercise, so it's, it's often done by a lead assessor, but really it's a team exercise, and this is what the standard says. So because it needs all different disciplines um, input into the FSA, um, it's really a team exercise, but it tends to have a, a lead assessor. So you need to make sure you've got all the necessary expertise um, feeding into it. It also says the membership of the team shall include at least one senior competent person not involved in the project design team or not involved in the operation and maintenance, depending at what stage you're carrying out your FSA. Um, so it needs to be a fully independent person who's competent and not involved in the associated activities. And there's some guidance in IEC 61508 about the levels of independence needed based on consequences um, that you're dealing with and, or, or SIL targets. And the stages in the um, life cycle at which the FSA activities are to be carried out shall be identified during the safety planning. So you have something called a functional safety plan or, or, or your safety plan. Um, and we need to define within that plan exactly when we're going to carry out FSAs, who's going to be doing them, what procedures they're going to be following, etc. And it's important to keep in mind FSAs are, are a key part of your planned safety and verification validation activities. They are your clear evidence that demonstrates that you're in compliance with the standard and therefore the assessor needs to be again sufficiently independent, competent um, and able to perform a robust assessment against a clear criteria. Um, it's a judgment so the assessor it helps if the assessor is pragmatic, um, they understand what needs to be addressed before what's the most important things, what needs to be addressed before this system can operate and before hazards can be introduced to the to the process. Um, and they should understand what's just a nice to have, what's an opportunity for improvement that could be closed out at a later date um, through action management. So when should we do an FSA? Well, IC 61511, which as I mentioned, is aimed at integrators and end users in the process sector. Um, that describes five stages of FSA, so I'll talk through those. And I'll go into more detail in these in, in section three, but stage one is following your hazard and risk assessment, allocation of safety function to protection layers, so your LOPA study, um, or and once you've produced your safety requirement specification for the for the safety system. Stage two is following the once you've designed and engineered the system based on the SRS. Stage three is before you introduce hazards to the process and it's once you've installed, commissioned and validated the system again against the SRS um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail. Stage four is a periodic FSA that we do during the operations and maintenance phase so once we have some experience of operating the system um, and seeing how it actually performs and how the testing is going. And stage five is following any modifications to the safety system or modifications to the process or plant that may affect uh, the, the safety system. So, um, and it, that is, is almost like a mini stage three FSA. Um, you just go back to the phase that, that's, um, that's needed. So in summary, FSA should be conducted throughout the, the phases of the life cycle to provide evidence and traceability that the requirements of the standard to be met for each phase. The plan for the project or for the asset should explain the different stages, depending on the standard that's being followed when to perform them and what documentation is required for them. Um, and that allows responsible people to plan and determine the best way forward with FSAs um, and ensure they're completed successfully. And it's possible that even with sufficient preparation, actions will be raised during the FSA. And, and that's just the nature of bringing in an independent person because we all do things differently. Um, but once the actions have been addressed and closed out, it, it really can 
work towards continuous improvement for functional safety within within an organization um so it's about lessons learned and it's it's a really good opportunity to get a second pair of eyes and 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 look back across the life cycle and make sure the system isn't degrading and that it's um that all your systematic errors are being um, picked up okay so part three is the learnings from fsa's uh, particularly focused on the end users and I'll talk through each stage of the F of uh, FSAs uh, to go through these learnings. So as I mentioned, stage one is after your hazard and risk assessment, protection layers have been identified and the SRS has been developed. But it's also an opportunity to review the functional safety management um, system, for the way things are being planned and, and verification activities. So some key points for end users then. So stage one FSA is not just about HAZOP, LOPA and SRS. There's a tendency to focus just on these documents. And as I mentioned, at this early stage, it, there should be significant functional safety planning on the project. Um, roles and responsibilities should be well defined. Verification and validation activities should be planned. We should have clear competency management system in place and configuration management, etc. Um, and the way to think about this is if we didn't have a, a competent HAZOP or LOPA team, we didn't have the right people there, um, we didn't have the right expertise developing our SRS. Um, you're going to be in trouble and you're going to have problems down the line in, in the uh, in the life cycle. Um, and also it's it's important that we get all this stuff in place early on, because if we start to introduce functional safety plans as we're installing and commissioning the system, there's going to be problems from those earlier phases. The next thing I wanted to touch on is alignment and line of sight. I've mentioned it a few times. There's, there's a fundamental concept in the life cycle and in functional safety that if if I come to your facility and, and during the operations phase and, and select a, a specific SIF or safety function, I should be able to look back through all the life cycle documentation for that particular SIF all the way back through to the HAZOP study to see where those initial requirements came from and then back again through the LOPA, through the safety requirement specification, through the FDS, through the design and so on to see exactly where these requirements have come from and how they've been carried through the life cycle. Um, so that's really important. And I've said here, without alignment to the hazard and risk assessment, you can't be sure that all of your hazards are addressed and the SIF functions as it was intended to um, back when it was specified. Um, and it should be clear, it should be clear where an SRS requirement originates from. Otherwise, there may be amb ambiguity within the SRS and gaps in the FSA um, and also during later li life cycle phases. And the third point is that if we have a poor HAZOP, a poor LOPA, we're going to end up with a poor SRS and we're not going to specify the requirements of the safety system, safety function um, properly. So we often see these types of problems with HAZOPs and LOPAs. There's been no terms of reference in place. It's been a bit of a rushed job. Um, limited study teams, inaccurate input documentation. So draft, it's based on draft PNIDs, draft drawings. We often see consequences not fully developed, inappropriate credits for safeguards and conditional modifiers as part of the low per methodology. Um, and all of these problems can lead to a lack of quality in, in the SRS, which ultimately leads to inad an inadequate design and assumption engineering in the later phases. We also often see that third parties are often the ones that carry out the design of these systems, and they're just going to make assumptions if the SRS is, has got gaps in it or it's got um, it's, it's missing key information. So it's really important that we get that SRS right, and that's based on making sure that we do our HAZOPs and our SIL determination properly. And I thought at this stage, I'd just refer to this, which comes from a HSC document, out of control, why control systems go wrong and how to prevent failure. Um, so the HSC did some analysis of incidents relating to control system failure, looking for root causes of incidents. Um, they actually found most happened due to errors in more than one phase of the life cycle. Um, but they selected the most significant. So it's obviously a fairly subjective study and it's based on quite a small sample size. I think it's about 50 incidents, but some interesting results. So the results showed that a significant percentage, around 44% of um, incidents were attributed to the specification phase, which really in terms of functional safety uh, terms is includes the hazard and risk assessment, it includes the SIF definition, and it includes the obviously the, the safety requirement specification part. So it really emphasizes the importance um, of these early phases in eliminating systematic errors um, at this early stage. And I think that alone is a huge reason why you should carry out the FSAs as early as possible at stage one, um, because a lot of people don't and they delay and, and wait until those later stages. Um, so it's really important that we capture any issues 
at this early stage if possible. While there's still opportunity to make the change. OK, stage two uh, FSA is an interesting one. It's when you've defined your SRS and you're interpreting it into a design. Um, so it includes the hardware and software elements, and uh, it's basically trying to achieve the requirements of the SRS, including the SIL target. So it's, it's your SIL achievement. And again, we need to look at the management, the planning and verification activities. Does the sensor um, need to be some specific type of transmitter due to foaming in the vessel or something like that? So if these points aren't stated clearly in the SRS, they may be missed and you may end up with a design that doesn't provide the protection against the hazardous event that it should. Another thing we often see is that the design um, part, the SIL verification part, only includes PFD calculations, so that's probability of failure on demand. Um, in order to achieve a SIL target, you need to demonstrate more than just the PFD being achieved. You need to demonstrate all of the things listed here. So the first two points on that list come under the category of hardware safety integrity. So the first one is random hardware failures. This is your PFD calculation, but we often see this done using simplistic equations that don't include things like um, test frequencies, um, test coverage factors, common cause failures, etc. So that's the first part, and that's your PFD calculation to calculate your random hardware failures, and that corresponds to a SIL. The second part of hardware safety integrity is architectural constraints, and that's talking about hardware fault tolerance and safe failure fractions. Um, the reason the standard asks for this is that it's, it's to compensate for uncertainties in failure rates and assumptions in the design, and it limits the um, the SIL that can be achieved by certain configurations. So it's it's to give you it make sure you, you put in the right amount of redundancy and the, the right amount of safe failures within your system. The third one is systematic safety integrity. So this is demonstrating that the system has been designed, particularly the software part, that, the, that it's been designed and developed in a certain way for a, spe for a specific function. Um, and the way that we calculate the systematic capability is we look at each individual device, see how it's been developed and what safety integrity level it can achieve. Um, and we do something called synthesis of elements, which sounds really difficult, but it's actually quite uh, simple. Once you've, once you've demonstrated that each device can meet the SIL target. There's then the fourth part is, is the one I've mentioned a few times, so it doesn't matter if it can achieve all of those things. If you aren't controlling functional safety management, you aren't clearly doing your verification activities, managing competency, etc., then you can't claim that you've achieved the, the SIL target. The third one is during the design, not considering um, how we're going to operate and maintain the system. This is something we often see when we come in and do a, a stage two FSA. Um, so the design, not considering testing requirements, it might be that it's not considering the, the required the target spurious trip rate, the way that we're going to override or bypass the system. Um, and this is particularly important if we've assumed a high proof test coverage during the design, during the SIL verification. OK, so stage three, as a reminder, is prior to the introduction of hazards and, and before, before we hand over to operations um, following installation, uh, commissioning and validation. So it's a review of the installation. It's a review of your commissioning procedures and documentation, and it's a review of your Review, the most important part is reviewing the validation exercise, which is validating that the, all the requirements of the SRS have been met um, and a review of operational readiness as well. So the first part, a lot of people think this is the most important one. Um, the standard says that you need to do an FSA before you introduce hazards into the system. So we often get brought in to do an FSA at this stage, um, but if they haven't done a stage one and stage two FSA, then you're going to have to look at the earlier documentations as part as part of your stage three FSA. Um, so it doesn't make sense to, to just do a stage three FSA. So it, it isn't just the only important one. The, they're all important. Um, as I've mentioned, if you don't do your stage one and two, you're going to have to do stage one and two as part of your stage three. And if you're then finding issues with your LOPA study, for example, it's a bit late to do that when you've already designed the system, you've got people there installing it. Um, so if it's done properly, the stage three should build on the previous assessments um, and you should just be able to see that the actions have been closed from stages one and two and just focus on the installation commissioning and validation. We often find uh, challenges in scheduling the, the uh, stage three FSA. Um, so again, we often get brought in in that final week before the system is switched on. Um, if it's a, I've been on pipelines where they, they need to shut down the pipelines to upgrade the system. Um, so it, the whole 
pro the whole process is, is squeezed into a couple of days and it makes it very difficult if you find any big ticket actions or any any issues with the design or anything like that um so what we kind of recommend is to maybe do a partial assessment where you maybe look do it, the first part of the fsa maybe looking at the installation commissioning and validation um plans looking at the documentation um so you can pick up any issues before you turn up on site and it's um it's the day before the planning to start up um we often find that validation is not planned or, or even completed prior to the fsa um, so, as I've mentioned, validation is a key thing we're going to be looking at at the stage three FSA validation against the SRS, um, and it should be planned and the system should be commissioned and the validation should be done prior to the, the FSA, um, and it should be against the SRS, not against the cause and effect, which is something we often see. And the fourth a question we often get asked is, can a stage three FSA be passed if any actions are open? Well, it depends on the it depends on the actions. If you've got some administrative issues open. And you've got a reasonable action management system in place then it may be possible to say yeah we, we're happy to pass the fsa once these actions are closed or if these actions are closed within the next six months or year or whatever um at the end of the day it's a judgment call the whole fsa is a judgment uh, from a competent person so they, they can be pragmatic um and it, the, the main question they're trying to answer is has functional safety been achieved prior to hazards um being introduced and are there any open actions that directly impact on that functional safety being achieved. Um, so it's it depends on the actions for that one. So a stage four FSA is again after gaining some experience in operations and maintenance, it's a periodic assessment and it's now mandatory in, in, in 61511 to carry out a periodic stage four FSA. Um, we're often asked how often these should be performed. It really depends on the mission time of the safety system. So if it's a system that's going to be in operation for 20, 30 years, um, we would usually see it done between every every two to five years, um, but it depends on it depends on the system. You may decide to do the free, to increase the frequency at the beginning to see how the system's performing, and then stretch out the FSAs after that. Um, if it's a really short mission time, something like a, a two year mission time, then um, you may we may see them done every six to nine months, something like that. So this is a review of your operation and maintenance after a period of operation. It's a review of how you've been proof testing the system, the results of those tests, what you've done in response to those results, and also a review of um, your records. So any fault and demand um, recording um, and how the system's actually performing against how we expected it to perform when we did the uh, specification and the design. So we used to get asked, do we really need to do this? Obviously, the answer is yes. Um, at this point, the system is it's not an idea anymore. It's not a specification or a best guess. It's now a reality. It's its measurable. Um, so why wouldn't you want to confirm that the system is is working as you assumed it was going to work during the design and how you assumed all the other safeguards were going to uh, to work? Um, so it enables you to confirm that the risk reduction is actual rather than just estimated. And we said that how many times you sit in, in workshops if you are involved in things like LOPA studies and think I'm not quite sure if that's actually correct. Um, it's a best guess. Um, it's very much a finger in the air. So it's it's an opportunity to review that and, and, and get it right. Demands and failure rates being poorly or simply not recorded. So this is something that people really struggle with. It's it's a big ask to to collect all this data and analyze it. Um, there should be clear fault and demand reporting guidelines um, within the organization with appropriate forms embedded into the maintenance management system to make it easier for operators to and maintenance personnel to record these things. Um, and then we want to see them being analysed. So there's there's various packages out there. There's, it, it doesn't need to be too complicated. It's just about having these systems in place um, to record and then analyse and, and go back. And it can it can be a huge benefit if you see that actually we were way too conservative during the initial studies. We actually can um, push these test intervals out a little bit. So it's it can it can be a, a benefit to do this as well um, from a kind of maintenance point of view. And it's a regulatory requirement only. Um, so we we get pushback on on carrying out these these FSAs, um, and and it's often seen as just a tick box exercise. But no, it should be part built into your functional safety management system. Um, and if you're claiming that functional safety has been achieved, then we need to do these FSAs and, and do them properly. And the final one is a stage five, which, as I mentioned, is following modification to the system um, or to the process that impacts on the system. 
So it's a review of the impact analysis, review of earlier phases as required, and a review of your modification activities. And again, looking at your management systems and, and planning and verification activities. So in a stage five FSA, it really supports change um, management of change. Um, so it could be following a modification to the SIS itself, changing out a valve, something like that, or it could be a modification to other systems that affect the SIS functionality or reliability. Um, so for example, does the change impact on the safety system in any way? Does it degrade its functionality or does it change the hazard? Does it affect flow rates or pressures? Um, and if it does, then you may need to go all the way back to your HAZOP and check that that is still valid. Um, and it becomes almost a mini um, life cycle stage three FSA really, where you go back to the affected phase and, and check that everything's still um, as it should be. We often find that there's been no impact analysis carried out. So I think people think that if, we, if we're bringing in someone to do a stage five FSA, that is our impact analysis. But know that the stage, the main input to the stage five FSA should be an impact analysis. That's where you look at the modification, look at how it's impacting on the earlier life cycle phases and decide what what possibly needs to be looked at and what needs to be updated. And again, is it mandatory? And it's similar to the previous one. It's it's part of the functional safety management requirement. Therefore, it is mandatory and it's part of your your claimed functional safety. OK, the final slide then is just some key um, further recommendations and, and takeaway points. So a key one that I've mentioned quite a bit is ensuring that there's a line of sight between each phase of the life cycle. Um, so as I mentioned, if we have that in place, we can see that everything has been brought through as it should, and it means that the system won't degrade over time. Um, and it means that particularly if, particularly if other organisations are involved in different activities, it's really important that we have that, that clear line of sight, and that's what the verification part is all about. We need to carry out FSAs at all stages to identify issues early in the project and before it's too late to do anything about them. Um, and it comes back to that pie chart that I showed. So um, if we identify issues early in the project, um, we, we stand a much better chance of ironing out all those systematic errors that could be the reason that the system doesn't perform. I haven't mentioned supplies and third parties too much, but because we are relying often on someone else doing the design or someone else doing the installation, we need to make sure that those organisations also have an approved functional safety management system. Um, and have the required competence uh, to carry out those activities. And something that I, I haven't really mentioned is that we should have a functional safety plan in place for any of our projects or possibly for our assets or pieces of equipment. Um, and this document really is how we implement our management system on a particular project. So the management system might have um, various roles and responsibilities defined, but the plan is the one where we start naming names. So we're going to use this, this specific person this is their competency records. Here's a reference to that. Um, this is when we're exactly when which dates we're going to do functional safety assessments, um, how we're going to carry them out. So it's really telling telling you how you're going to implement your management system on that specific project. It should be a live document. So as the project progresses, it should be updated. Um, we need to assign responsibilities and demonstrate competency, as I mentioned. We need to describe what techniques and measures we're going to use throughout the process. So in terms of developing software, what, what techniques and measures we're going to use. Um, we need to clearly define inputs and outputs from each phase of the life cycle. So as part of the design, what are we expecting to see? Are we going to have PNIDs? Are we going to have a cause and effect? Are we going to have other types of um, electrical drawings? Um, and how are we going to carry those through to the installation, commissioning and validation? Um, and the plan should, as I mentioned, define the FSA requirements and other validation and verification activities. And finally, FSAs are not only there to find issues, but they should be seen as a way of continuous improvement for functional safety. And I think that's why the standards put such an emphasis on them as being mandatory. Um, it's an opportunity to get a fresh pair of eyes. Um, it's an opportunity for someone to come in and look back through the life cycle and, and ensure that the system isn't degrading and that it's um, doing what it was intended to do in the first place. Um, so we should see it as a, as a positive, even though it, it when you get a list of actions, especially if you've left it to the last minute um, as part of a stage three FSA. OK, and that's the end of the uh, webinar content. Thanks very much for listening and attending.